Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and to talk about one of my favorite drugs, for which I have no disclosures uncharacteristically. So I thought since it's the 16th anniversary of uh, the iPledge program, and we all wanted to wish it a happy birthday, that we would start talking a little bit about pregnancy prevention and start to uh, review what we know about it and what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Clearly, we recognize that the stakes are very high, that the risk management programs have not been particularly helpful for us, and I'd like to ask the question, is abstinence a valid choice for I pledge birth control? And who should be prescribing the birth control? So I'll piggyback a little bit on what Julie was just talking about. The stakes we're all well aware of. The incidence of embryopathy depends on the timing and the duration of the exposure, but is somewhere between 28 and 47 percent of fetal exposures. We have a lot of defects that can occur as a result of it, most of which are quite severe. 50% of women taking isotretinoin in the United States are female, and the vast majority of them are females of childbearing potential. So this is a particularly important issue to consider. So everybody always asks, you know, we've gone through all of this with iPledge. Has it actually worked? Has it been worth it? Well, we only have data from the first year. In 2007, they analyzed the data, and they saw that there were about 122 pregnancies in that year, compared to 127 in the previous year on our previous risk management program called SMART. Bear in mind that this also, during this year, represented a 39% drop in the number of prescriptions that were written. So that number should have gone down dramatically. On the other hand, the mandatory pregnancy reporting that was seen with iPledge might have captured more accurate data and might have shown a great increase in the number of pregnancies as reporting it on SMART was only a suggestion and I hazard a guess that many of us who had pregnancies on this drug perhaps were not willing to report it. So we're not really sure if iPledge has helped compared to SMART, but at any rate, we still had 122 pregnancies. And while, although I have not been privy to the data since then, it's still apparently somewhere in the vicinity of 120 pregnancies per year. So we can't rely on the risk management program alone to prevent pregnancy. What else do we know about our women taking birth control? We know that 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned that more than 50% of these unplanned pregnancies say they're on contraception at the time of conception. I don't think so. The first year discontinuation rate of most of our birth control methods is extremely high, especially for condoms. They start off very gung-ho, and then by the end of the year, they've dropped off by 57%, and oral contraceptives by 33%. This suggests to me that we ought to be considering long-acting birth control methods like IUDs and implants in our patients on isotretinoin to take the forgetfulness, at least, out of the equation. So what are our patients actually doing while they're on isotretinoin? Well, in this small anonymous survey of isotretinoin patients who had been on the drug for at least two months, 28% of those patients had said that they were going to be abstinent throughout their course. Well, guess what? Only about 19% of them decided to become sexually active or to be sexually active during treatment. Fortunately, most of them did use a birth control method during that time, but only 90% used condoms and 46% used oral contraceptive pills. 12 admitted to using one or fewer forms of birth control during their time on isotretinoin. 10 failed to use condoms, and one said, unprotected intercourse the entire time. And 39% said they reported missing at least one pill per month, again suggesting that we need to find some way to take the daily use of a product to reduce or an incident use uh, of a birth control product out of the hands of our patients if it is at all possible. So that was the risk of utilizing abstinence in an adult woman. What about in a teenager? Well, in a study of about almost 3,500 middle high school students, where half of them were folks who had taken an abstinence pledge a pledge to stay abstinent until the time of marriage, were compared to age-matched non-pledgers. What do you think happened about five years later? Fully 82% of those who had pledged said, what pledge? 
I never signed any kind of pledge. They could, not only did they not do it, but they completely forgot, or that perhaps they were lying, that they had even done it to begin with. There was no difference between the two groups in the incidence of premarital sex. The pledgers, when they did have sex, were less likely to use condoms or birth control, perhaps because they weren't prepared, or perhaps they weren't even aware of it. If they were going to stay abstinent until marriage, perhaps they had never even had the conversation of what to do should that situation change. And increased risk of pregnancies and STDs were seen in the pledging group compared to the non-pledgers. So I would suggest to you that you look very carefully at your teenagers who you're going to call abstinent and make sure you've had a very good conversation with them and in my opinion a conversation with a mom in the other room. So maybe they just don't understand, maybe they just don't get it, right? They don't understand what birth control can and cannot do. So this anonymous survey of 100 women assessed the knowledge of contraceptive methods, and they did a pretest followed by some reading material and then a post-test. And at the time of the pretest, they were asked to rank birth control methods from least to most effective. And what they found was that fully over 50% of patients overestimated the efficacy of condoms especially, but also oral contraceptive pills and injections. Most of them felt that condoms were infallible, for example. They did better after they read the material. Unfortunately, the authors found that the mean amount of time that they spent looking at this crucial and critical piece of information was less than one minute. So not only did they not get it, but they didn't seem to care about whether they did get it. So I think we all know that if we push too hard with our birth control methods before isotretinoin, we may have patients who are less than truthful. If you say to a young woman, it's birth control pill, it's adequate birth control, birth control pill, IUD, implant, or I'm not gonna give you this drug, many of them, I think in my practice, just yes me to death. Okay, give me the prescription. Are you on it? Yeah, sure. I pledge every month. Yeah, I'm on it, right? They, they want the drug, and if I push too hard, I'm concerned that I'm going to make them lie to me, and I would rather, honestly, that they be truthful. We have some evidence of this. In that first data that I showed you for iPledge, there were 122 pregnancies, as I mentioned. 72% of them pledged that they were using oral contraceptives and condoms. Again, I don't think so. Right? The, the two forms, if taken appropriately, are virtually 100% successful. 18% of those who became pregnant said they were abstinent. I'm quite sure that that was not a possibility. So I'm forced to conclude that our patients forget to use their birth control, especially birth control pills and condoms. They're in denial regarding their risks and the effectiveness of the birth control that they actually are using. And unfortunately, they also seem to be lying to me. I think that this means that the evidence suggests that long-acting, more infallible birth control methods are more appropriate for our isotretinoin patients. So are we doing that? Are we doing a good job in counseling our patients for contraception on isotretinoin? This was a small study, but it was an interview of 16 female college students who had used isotretinoin, and they were asked, how good was your counseling information by your dermatology practitioner? Well, they said, I totally got the idea that this drug is teratogenic. I got that. But the process was very anxiety-provoking. It was not like going to a GYN and having a conversation about birth control. It was a conversation about uh, birth defects more than it was actual counseling. For many of these women, this was their first introduction into birth control, and it's a shame that it, was, it took place under such duress. The providers, in all cases, immediately defaulted to birth control pills. They didn't discuss, they didn't mention the possibility of implants and IUDs. I don't know if that's because we're way more comfortable with birth control pills, so we just sort of defaulted to that. But I suggest that this means that we either need to familiarize ourselves with those other methods and refer appropriately, or or refer appropriately. Get it to a gynecologist who's going to do a better job. Uh, I mean, how much time do you have to do birth control counseling under ordinary circumstances? So I agree with what Julie said under the best of circumstances, but I think we don't have enough time to do this adequately. 
What about muscle fatigue? This is something that occurs quite frequently now in my practice. I recently switched from Brooklyn, where nobody ever exercises at all in high school. We're lucky if we have room for a half a basketball court in a school, to Morristown, New Jersey, where everybody plays ice hockey and field hockey and lacrosse, and everybody's on three teams. Now I've got an issue with muscle fatigue. We have numerous multi multi musculoskeletal side effects reported on this drug, myalgia, pr pr primarily in patients who are elite athletes and doing a lot of exercise, reported in about 50% of patients. In those patients, we see an elevated CK frequently, fortunately rarely associated with rhabdomyolysis. But we have limited data on what this means. If your muscle is sore, does that mean that you're actually going to have a reduction in your athletic prowess? Are you going to be less strong? Are you going to be more fatigued or have a lower endurance? And should we recommend to our elite athletes, especially our teenage kids who have a possibility to college scholarship, to avoid utilizing isotretinoin during their active season, or perhaps indeed at all? So we have one study that looked into this since we started to discuss it, a study of 27 acne patients and 26 age-matched controls. The acne patients were all given isotretinoin starting at a half a mg per kg for a month and then up to one milligram per, per, uh, per day for two months. They did iso isokinetic measurements of the hamstrings and the quads at baseline and at month three, and what they found was absolutely no difference between the groups. Five patients in the isotretinoin group did complain of myalgias, but they were no different from their own baseline, nor from the folks who were not on isotretinoin. So the authors concluded that although the muscles may be sore to touch, that there's no physiologic reason to assume that there will be a decrease in athletic abilities unless the patients, because of the discomfort, are guarding and not performing up to task. There's also been a flurry of frequency of laboratory man, uh, monitoring studies. This first saw, looked at a systematic review of 61 studies, found a statistically significant change in the mean value of the white blood cell count and hepatic and liver panels, not surprisingly. The proportion of patients, however, with these abnormalities was very low, and the mean change did not reach any kind of level that they would have been concerned. The interesting fact from this paper was that there was no difference between the blood tests at week 8 and the blood tests at week 20, and the authors concluded, therefore, that perhaps all we need to do is baseline and month 1 and 2 and stop doing blood tests after that, unless, of course, there was an abnormality in earlier on. Another single center review of lab data looked at 515 patients who had taken 574 courses of isotretinoin. They found a clinically insignificant decrease in white blood cell count and platelets, and the transaminases, although increased slightly, were infrequent and not statistically significant. They also saw, as with most studies, an increase in statistically significant increase in triglycerides and cholesterol. But the interesting thing was that it took almost two months for those elevations to become significant. So their conclusion was there's no need to check a white blood cell count. There's no need to check labs until two months. You can skip that one month mark. And you may need to check, may not need to check it beyond two months. The most recent by Webster et al. was a retrospective chart review of 246 patients seen over a period of nine years. Standard increase in cholesterol and triglyceride, but the interesting fact from this study was that 35 of the patients had an elevated AST, but they all also had an elevated CK. 32 had an increase in ALT, but 11 also had an increase in CK. Now we know that AST and ALT are not liver specific, they're also found in muscle and red blood cells, and if the sample hemolyzes, the red blood cell releases them, and it looks as if there's a hepatic abnormality. CK, on the other hand, is muscle specific. So an increase in AST in this study was always associated with an increase in CK, suggesting that it was a muscle source, not hepatic. GGT, on the other hand, is, more liver is completely liver-specific. It's also not elevated lest the sample become hemolyzed. In this study, there was only 13 patients with a GGT, kind of an encouraging increase in amount. Five were isolated, eight also had an elevation in ALT and AST, but only two were associated with an increased CK. 
The CK was increased in a lot of patients, as you can see here, especially in guys. It's recognizing, of course, that what we're looking for is a statistical outlier. It's all well and good that the mean looks as if we don't have to check blood tests, but we're looking for that one patient sitting in front of us and their laboratory values. But be that as it may, the tests do suggest that we don't have to monitor past two months, that we may not to need to monitor at the one month mark. We now have four studies, if every, anybody's keeping track, including the Zane study from 2006, that suggests that CBCs are unnecessary to evaluate. To replace the ALT and the AST with GGT monitoring, and make sure you're checking CK, especially if you live in Morristown, New Jersey. Thank you very much for your attention.